All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open God's word together, let's bow our heads together and ask his guidance on our study this morning. Our Father, we're thankful for this time that we have together to be refreshed by your word, to come to a great understanding of who our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he went through prior to the cross to come to understand some of the dynamics that impacted him personally, deeply, profoundly, that there is in many ways a parallel with our own lives and his response is that which gives us a pattern for how to face the difficulties, the pressures, the traumas, the challenges of life. Father, we know that you have a will that is revealed in Scripture to us and that we are to walk by your Spirit and walk by your Word and that as we do that, you will produce in us spiritual growth, maturity, and wisdom and skill at living. And we pray today that as we study these things, you'll help us to understand them a little more fully that we can imitate our Lord Jesus Christ We pray this in his name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26. We've been in Matthew now for almost three years, and it may take us a little while going through the last part because there's not only so much here, but each of these last three chapters are extremely long. There is so much in some of these sections, even though it is uh, mostly narrative, this section we're in right now has uh, conversation, it has dialogue, and that is important to understand. There are things that are said here that are not always understood. It goes beyond our finite minds to fully comprehend the depths of the suffering that the Lord went through that night before he went to the cross as he anticipated what would happen the next day. But there are important things that we can understand and in my reading and study of uh, a lot of things that have been written about the Lord's time in the Garden of Gethsemane and his prayer, it, it also has impressed me that there are aspects to this that are just not probed. They're not probed for a number of reasons but they're just not, and and there's some fascinating things that are going on here, not that I'm going to cover everything exhaustively, but try at least to answer some questions and to probe what's going on here, because we know that all Scripture is given to us for instruction, for rebuke, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. So we are to learn from this that all Scripture has been breathed out by God, and this extends to every word. These aren't just interesting little stories or uh, descriptions of things that happened a long time ago in the life of, of Jesus, but they are recorded for our benefit and for us to learn. So this today we're going to look at this as a pattern for how to handle and face adversity. Now what we have seen so far is that this is part of the last week of our Lord on the earth. And as I examine the scriptures and we look at the Gospels, there's so much that's in the Gospels. I think somewhere between a quarter to a third of what we know about the life of our Lord Jesus Christ occurred in that last week. Maybe a little bit more. Because we have in John, in the Gospel of John, we have John 13, 
through John 18, 19, 20, when you include the, the crucifixion and resurrection, that's a huge chunk of the Gospel of John. We have in Matthew, from Matthew chapter uh, 20, as he is ascending to Jerusalem uh, about, eight, about seven days before the cross, from Matthew chapter 20 through Matthew chapter 28, that's, that's eight chapters. So when you combine that, that's a huge chunk. And we have two of the largest sections in Scripture of his instruction recorded that took place during this time. We studied the Olivet Discourse, which, which had to do with answering questions related to God's plan for Israel and the Jewish people in terms of fulfillment of prophecy. That was in Matthew 24 and 25. And then, it's not part of our study, but in the Gospel of John, you have what's called the Upper Room Discourse from John 13 uh, through John uh, 17, which all relates to, in the Upper Room, what he taught on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then uh, what transpired, what began to transpire there. All of that is, is recorded for us. So that's a, that's a big chunk of our Lord's teaching was just within uh, this, this last week. We've seen that the context of our, of our section here that begins in verse 36, where we read, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. As I pointed out last time, they're walking from the, roughly the area of what is known as Mount Zion, which is a little bit to the uh, south and west of the Temple Mount. And they're coming around the edge of the Temple Mount. And this is a picture of what it looks like today. This is the uh, wall built by Suleiman around the Temple Mount, which today houses the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. You're looking down here. This is the Kidron Valley. And they would have come around the southern side of the temple, most likely we don't know exactly what the path was, and then all along the Kidron Valley here, which is at the base of the Mount of Olives, which would be off to the left on the picture, that is uh, all covered with olive trees. And it was even more covered in the time of Jesus. And there was an area that was called a Garden of Gethsemane. Now what we think of as a garden is something that has been uh, well, well kept, and it may be a vegetable garden, it may be a flower garden, and so that communicates something to the English mind that is not exactly what the way in which it was used at that time. You, same problem when it t talks about the tomb of Christ, that there was a garden near the uh, place of crucifixion. A garden can just be an area where there are, where there are trees an area where there are no buildings. It can, be, it can be a flower garden, it can be just a, it can be a grove of, uh, of olive trees, it can be any of those kinds of things. So that's the kind of thing that we see here and this is what it looks like today. These are some very ancient trees. And I pointed out last time that there's a, there's a significance to the location because the word Gethsemane refers to an oil uh, uh, an olive press and so these are a couple of pictures I showed you last time of the olive press where the olives would be placed under this roller here and usually a small donkey would be uh, tied to the uh, or harnessed to the post here and then he would walk in a circle around and that would crush the olives and then they would be put in a bag under this press and weights added would squeeze the oil out of the olives. And that's the picture that we see here. This is a time of testing. It is a time of testing for our Lord. It's a time of testing for his disciples. And as I pointed out last time, testing has two aspects. The word uh, pyrosmos, the noun, has can also be translated temptation because in the midst of a test, an objective test, there is the attraction to disobey, to do things the wrong way. That's the internal subjective side of a temptation. And often because we are sinners, we are drawn to that 
sinful side. Scripture defines sin as anything that is contrary to the will of God, anything that is apart from faith in other places. It is anything that is contrary to the character of God. That is the nature of sin. When we try to go it alone instead of independence upon God, then that can lead, that leads to sin. That is what sin is, is acting apart from God, being independent of God rather than dependent upon God. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this as we go through this section is because part of the questions that, are, that come to people's mind in the midst of this is that it's clear that Jesus is going through a, an emotionally traumatic event. Now that's often overlooked by a lot of people because it raises questions about, uh, about the impeccability of Jesus. Now that's a big word and it refers to his sinlessness. And the idea that the sinless Jesus has this emotional turmoil somehow doesn't gel with our preconceived notions of Jesus in a perfect humanity. That if you're perfect, and you have omniscience, you're, you're not going to have these kinds of problems. But as a human being, even as a sinless human being, he has the same nature that we do. That is why God had to enter into human history and become a man. God could not die for sin. But a man had to die for sin to stand in the place of man, and as such, he had to be two things. He had to be true humanity. He wasn't some sort of blend between God and man. So sort of take a little deity, take a little humanity, and mix it together. That was one early misconception in the church. And it is not that these are so disparate, so distinct, that they are not united. When we study what we call the hypostatic union, hypostatic is the word, the Greek word hypostasis, which refers to substance or the nature of Jesus. He has the full 100% nature of God. He's undiminished deity on the one hand. On the other hand, he is perfect humanity. He is complete human. He's not missing anything. And these two natures were somehow united together in the single person of Jesus. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, Jesus, uh, that, that was, Jesus did that in his deity. That's not the best way to put it. The, a better way to put it is that Jesus could do that reveals that he was fully God. That Jesus suffered emotional anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane shows that he was truly human, okay? But the one person, see, when we give that definition that goes back to the uh, Nicene Creed in 325 AD, that you have the undiminished deity and the true humanity of Jesus united together in one person, the one person of Jesus is suffering anguish at in Gethsemane. It's that one person who turned the water into wine. Changing the water into wine showed that he was fully God. It demonstrated that he was, he was the creator. Uh, healing the lepers demonstrated that he was fully God. But he's not doing this from, he's not like this multi, multiple personality. He's one person person united together. Now that's a heavy thought for a lot of people because it goes beyond our ability to fully comprehend it. We can understand the truth, but we can't understand it exhaustively. The writer of Hebrews says a lot about this. Hebrews 4.15 says that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now that's a double negative, do not and cannot cancel each other to make a positive. So what he is saying is we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because he was fully human and he went through the same kinds of things that we did yet, as it says here, without sin. So whatever happens in the Garden of Gethsemane reveals to us 
that he is going through the pressure of the test, but he is not choosing to respond to the test in a way that violates the will of God. But the pressure is real, it is significant, and it is very much a part of his, of his maturation process in his humanity. In Hebrews 2.10, it was fitting for him, that is God the Father, to whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect or mature through sufferings. He had to, in his humanity, he had to grow from being a baby to being an adolescent to being an adult. And he had to grow spiritually. He had to learn the scriptures. And he had to memorize the scriptures. And he had to apply the scriptures. And he had to, because he's a pattern for every, every human being. Now, when we take these elements of who Jesus is and we look at what's going on here, we recognize that, that something profound is happening here, something that, that makes a lot of people a little bit uncomfortable because they don't slice the bologna thin enough as one of my seminary professors always loved that phrase, that some people slice the bologna too thin, but it just means that we have to get detailed enough in our understanding to realize that on the one hand, Jesus doesn't sin, but on the other hand, he is profoundly pressured to sin. And what we see here is that pressure that is perfectly pictured by that olive press imagery that's going on in Gethsemane. I pointed out last time that this is revealed by these words in Matthew that he's sorrowful, he's deeply distressed. Mark uses, also uses the word for being deeply distressed, but he uses a different word for troubled. Okay, Matthew's two words are lupeo, for sorrowful, which has to do with grief, grieving, being excess, extremely sorrowful, and ademoneo, which means to be burdened. He's under pressure. Mark uses this word ekthambeo, which has, I've been reading more and studying more upon the usage of this particular word in the last, uh, in the last week. And it has the root idea of, of something that can cause a surprise. So some people raise the question, what surprised Jesus at this time? I think the answer to that can be somewhat subjective, but one writer, a former seminary professor of mine who many years ago wrote a paper on this, makes a suggestion. I'm not sure he's right on target, but I think he's not in the center of the target, but I think he's close. And that is there's an element of pressure that's going on here in the Garden of Gethsemane that's related to the angelic conflict. That there is a temptation here. We haven't heard much from Satan. You look at the fact that in the life of Jesus, you start off back in Matthew 4 with the temptation. Jesus go, is taken by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. There are the three temptations of Jesus by Satan. We don't hear anything about Satan again until we get later on when, when you get to uh, the point where, where uh, Peter is encouraging the Lord to go ahead and bring in the kingdom, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, that, that what Peter is saying there it, it has its origin from satanic influence. And then when we get to this point, we recognize that Satan has indwelt uh, Judas, that Jesus has told Peter that Satan has asked for permission to sift him, and that Satan is suddenly seems to be more a focal point, even though he's not mentioned right in this context. This is the, the ultimate struggle between righteousness and evil is, it, as Jesus is preparing to go to the cross to pay for our sins. And so this is part of this dynamic that is going on here that in some sense, Jesus is, in his humanity is becoming aware of a dimension of this pressure. And it's, it's, 
he is seeing what is going to happen the next day. It's not new news to him. How many times have we heard that he has proclaimed that on the next that he is going to be go to Jerusalem? He's going to be betrayed. He is going to be crucified. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise on the third day. None of that is new information. But I think in his humanity there is a new realization that on the next day the sins of the world are going to be poured out on him and he is going to be judicially separated from the Father. And this is a profound realization that is causing this anguish. Now we can't minimize this anguish. Some people want to minimize the anguish because they're not comfortable with Jesus being emotional. You can't avoid this. There is a state of emotion that occurs uh, uh, when somebody is under extreme pressure called hematridosis, hematridosis, which is when you sweat blood. Luke, who's a physician, is the only one who tells us this, that the pressure became so great in this time in the garden that our Lord sweated blood. It just, the, the tiny capillaries around the sweat glands, be, the pressure is so great that they begin to leak blood into the sweat glands. And there are known, there, it's extremely rare, but there are known cases of this taking place. This happens because of the degree of pressure that our Lord is feeling. The writer of Hebrews later on says in reference to those who are uh, resisting or not resisting temptation says have you resisted to the point of death I'm not going to ask the question how many of us have come close to resisting the temptation of sin to the point of death fighting it so desperately that that you are almost dead because of it this is what's going on on the cross Jesus is fighting this external pressure so that tells us that whatever the pressures may be in your life or mine, that they don't even come close to the pressure that Jesus felt in his humanity when he's in the Garden of Eden, the pressure to disobey God, the pressure to go his own way, the pressure to follow uh, an independent will, as it were. In Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, the writer of Hebrews says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, he uses those two words to emphasize the intensity of his prayer. Now when Jesus is in the garden, we don't know how long he was there, but he, he makes this statement to Peter, you couldn't watch for just an hour. So he probably was there for more than 15 or 20 minutes. He was certainly praying these, what we have recorded here. For example, in um, verse 39, he prays, Oh, my Father. My Father is an extremely intimate phrase. Mark, in the parallel, uses the phrase Abba, Father. Now, Abba is Hebrew for Daddy. It's an intimate term. Paul says that we now cry Abba Father. We have that kind of an intimate relationship with the Father once we're saved. We're in the family of God. We're in the body of Christ. And we have that same intimate relationship. Well, this is the only time that we have Jesus using this term, expressing this close intimacy and dependence on the Father. This is a time of, of intense prayer. I believe that the writer of Hebrews is, though this, he doesn't specifically identify this time, I think it, it indicates that this is what he's talking about through the con context, the rest of what he says. Who in the days of his flesh, that is his humanity, his incarnation, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, notice the next line, with vehement cries, with intense cries, audible cries. Now when you look at the text in the synoptics, when you look at what Matthew, Matthew says, Matthew in verse 39 says, he went a little farther and fell on his face. That's an important thing 
Luke says that he knelt down and prayed. Mark says he fell down. Matthew gives us the full account. He fell on his face and prayed. He's prostrate. Now, this is not uncommon in the in, in a Middle Eastern personality. We most of us come out of a, uh, an Indo-European background, and we don't want to get too in touch with our emotions, and we certainly don't want to get too emotional or too excited about anything. So when we pray, we're going to close our eyes and we're going to bow our heads about a 20-degree tilt. We don't want anybody to think that we might be getting emotional. But if you were Jewish, you would typically get down on your knees when you prayed. You would pray out loud. We often think of prayer as something that is just silent. We're silent prayers more than audible prayers. Not that that's wrong. That's just a difference in, in culture and orientation. But when things were intense, they would get down prostrate, lying down on their face, fully stretched out in a position of subservience and submission to God in their prayer. And that physical, pro uh, physical posture is designed to exhibit the intensity and the importance of the prayer. And so Jesus falls on his face and he prays. Now that's one of the important things for us to realize when we are going through any sort of testing or temptation is prayer. Prayer, I often talk about the spiritual skills, the stress busters or problem solving devices. Prayer in of itself is not a problem solving device. Prayer is a tool because we pray in confession. We pray to express trust. We pray to... Uh, uh, express our love for God. Prayer is a vehicle for all of these different uh, distinctive things that, that we've identified. So prayer is the vehicle. Prayer is communicating to God what our needs are and how we are trusting God. It is a way in which we work through a situation. Now, for those of you who've been following along on the Tuesday night series in Samuel, we've seen this as we talked about the Psalms, that the Psalms express the emotions that David feels, that in many cases David is overwhelmed by his circumstances. They, these circumstances have generated emotions from fear, worry, anger. Uh, so, sometimes he's totally confused by what God is doing, and he expresses that to God, not in a sinful way, Remember the Old Testament in Psalms, in fact, in the Psalms, he says, be angry and do not sin. He is angry when he looks out at the world and the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering. And he comes to God and he says, I don't understand it. This isn't right. Okay, he's, ex he's not just saying academically, I don't understand the problem of evil here, Lord. He's not having a philosophical discussion in the way he's expressing himself in these psalms. Part of what it means to go to the Lord with our problems is to be willing to be honest with God that it's a problem. Not in a way where we're just accusing God, but to, to work through the solution to a difficulty in our life, we have to first of all admit, acknowledge there's really a problem here. And I'm confused, I'm upset, I, I don't understand. And then what happens? We don't stop there. See, a lot of people stop with their anger with God, their bitterness, their resentment, and they just stop there, I'm upset, they don't work through the process. They get, they don't eat, they get to bat and then they strike out. What happens in the Psalms is we see this same pattern that we see with our Lord here. There is a progression of thought as David thinks about who God is and the problem. He works from identifying and admitting and expressing the problem to talking about the character of God, talking about the plan and the purpose of God, and many times he will rehearse things that God has done for him in the past, and as he does this, his mental attitude shifts from the problem to the perfect solution to the problem, which is 
and his trust in God, and he closes with a praise to God. That's what we do in the process. It, it's not just because sometimes when I've said you ought to express your anger to God, people say, well, why? Well, it's being honest. You know, otherwise we come to God and we act like everything's okay and we're really got to have it together and we're just blowing smoke at God. To be honest, we have to express the, where we are emotionally and but don't stop there. Don't sit and dwell in it. Don't have a little spiritual pity party. Don't have a little anger attack at God. You move through it as you think through. But you have to have doctrine in your soul. You have to have the teaching of the Word of God in your soul, you have to have scripture that's memorized. You have to understand who God is and what his plan and purpose is so you can apply it in the thought progression. Otherwise, your prayers are pretty empty because there's nothing to have a conversation about. That's why people find that reading the Psalms is so important because it impacts how they're thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Jesus is offering up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears. Notice the level of emotion that there. He's, he's weeping and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Now, this isn't physical death. When it gets into the point, we'll, we'll discuss this, when Jesus prays, let this cup pass from me. It's clear that that cup is a reference to the cup of God's wrath. The term that is used here in the Greek is the term that is, there's several words that are used for cup in the Old Testament, but there's one word particularly that's used when it's talking metaphorically of the cup of God's wrath. This is the Greek word that's used of that. And it's talking about judgment. And that judgment that's going to come on the cross is not the judgment of physical death. The judgment that's going to come is the judgment of spiritual death the judicial separation of the Son from the Father. You can't have an ontological separation. That means that he can't be separated in his being from the Father. He and the Father are one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in the Trinity. You can't split him off. But when the Father imputes the sins of mankind to Jesus on the cross, because the Father can't have fellowship with that which is sinful, he is judicially, he isn't a sinner, but Paul says he becomes sin for us, so that he is judicially separated from the Father, and as he anticipates that, that is what he is talking about here, to save him from spiritual death, and, and I think it's more than that. And I'm still working through a lot of this as I'm reading and studying and thinking it through, but th some of the language that's used here isn't just that Jesus is fearful that he's going to be, pay the penalty for sin, but there's not going to be the recovery, restoration, and resurrection that comes afterward. He doesn't want, this is the midst of this intense spiritual conflict in the angelic conflict. And later on, he's going to pray that, that don't, he says, says in the second prayer, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. It will pass, but only if he drinks it. But his prayer is basically, to keep go through the, to make it through the whole process culminating in that resurrection that's why when we read in Hebrews 5 7 tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his godly fear now God didn't keep him from either physical death or spiritual death but he took him through the process and brought him out the other end and he was resurrected and ascended and is at the right hand of the Father now. Hebrews 5 8 says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Even the, when it uses the phrase son, that's a reference to his deity. But because he's also human, he had to grow, he had to learn obedience by the things he suffered. That doesn't mean that he was ever disobedient. But he had to go through that same learning process that every one of us goes through, but we learn more from what we failed than 
uh, what we do right. Jesus is the perfectly obedient son, but he has to be obedient for that maturity to engage. That is how he is perfected. The word there for perfected, per- perfect doesn't mean flawless. Being perfected, it, because he was already flawless, being perfected is the idea of being matured, being brought to completion, spiritual growth. So having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So what we see here is something that takes us back to to basic material that we've covered many, many times over the course of our study, and that is that when we face adversity in life, we have to understand that there's a difference between the external adversity and that which happens internally. So I want to go back and just try to take something abstract and chart it out for us. Every human being is made up of three components. We have a physical human body that was made from the dust of the earth, the chemicals of the soil, Genesis chapter 2. Then God breathed into man the breath of life. He has a soul that is in the image of God. He has a self-consciousness, I am. He has a mentality, I think. He has a consciousness, I ought. And he has volition, I will. That's what makes up the soul. Then there's a third element, which is that which binds it all together, and that is what we describe as the human spirit. When man dies spiritually, that human spirit is lost, so that we're soulish. The Greek word is psuchikos. The unsaved person is referred to as a natural man. The Greek word there is psuchikos. He's just soulish. He's not spiritual. He doesn't have that he doesn't have that spirit so he looks like this which means he's the living dead he is spiritually dead but he still has biological and mental functions but he is separated from god who is the source source of all life and when we trust in christ we receive a human spirit we are regenerate we're born again and that can never be taken from us now what happens and this slide is we have our soul is inside of our brain but when we have external adversity we normally respond with our sin nature isn't that right and that creates fragmentation in the soul and we associate that with all of those negative emotions but when we We realize that negative volition, we choose not to obey God, so that gives us in nature control, and it controls our soul. But Jesus doesn't have that. So when Jesus faces adversity, it's just putting external pressure on him. But that pressure was severe at this time. This This is his final test in his humanity before he goes to the cross. And so what we learn from this is how he addresses the solution in terms of his will versus God's will. Jesus had, as we saw, an, uh, an, as a person, second person of the Trinity, he had an, a, a will. But that will has always been dependent upon the Father. He's never exercised it independently. That was the pressure, that was the test in the garden, was would he operate independently of the Father? And that's the test we all face as human beings. Our default position is to operate independently from God. Our default position is to do it our own way. Our default position is to first try our solution and then try his solution. But Jesus doesn't have that internal pressure from the sin nature. He is pressured, though, to take a different course, to avoid the cross. But he says in verse 39, if it's possible... Theoretically, it is possible. He uses a first-class condition, and he says, assuming it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he also knows that it's not possible because he has to complete the plan of salvation. 
And then he says, not as I will, but as you will. He says, I'm not going to operate independently of your plan, no matter how great the pressure is. We're going to do it your way. And then he comes back to the disciples in verse 40, and we will take up with that. There are other things that we need to talk about in this passage, and we will do that next time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to reflect upon uh, who our Lord Jesus Christ is as true humanity and undiminished deity united in one person, and that in his humanity he is like we are, yet he was not born with sin and he was sinless. Nevertheless, the tests were real, the pressure was real, as we can see from how he responds and how it impacts him emotionally and how that emotion impacts him physically. This is a real test, but he doesn't sin. Too often we feel the internal pressure in temptation, we feel the physical pressure, and we just give in. We don't operate on trusting you. We do, our, our default position isn't to pray and to take these things before you and to wrestle with them in prayer, much as David did in the Psalms. Father, you've provided everything we need. The struggle is real. Often we think that if we have the Christian life, there's not going to be the struggle. Jesus struggled immensely, as we see here, and we're to follow that pattern of prayer and provision, not the pattern of giving in. Father, we pray that if anyone is listening to this lesson, this is really designed for teaching the believer the provision that we have in Christ. If you have never trusted in Christ as Savior, if you don't know what would happen if you were to die tonight, where you would go, then you need to make the first decision, the most important decision, that is to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the penalty for every single sin, no matter how egregious, horrible, uh, terrible you may think it is, Jesus paid the penalty for it. He died so that we might have eternal life. It's a free gift. Scripture says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy you saved us. That we are not saved by works, but by faith, trusting in Christ we have nothing whatsoever to do with our salvation other than simply accepting the free gift by believing Jesus died for us. Father, we pray that anyone listening who's never made that decision would make that decision, would trust in Christ. And we pray for those of us who are believers that we might be challenged by this example of our Lord to uh, struggle, wrestle with temptation, applying your word, spending time in prayer, understanding the importance of trusting in you, that victory through these trials is how we grow and mature as believers. And Father, challenge us with these things, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.